We'll do it in the next decade. We'll do it in this decade, actually. This is the decade of opportunity. I was saying that we, we've no Ardesh, we've no party conference this year, um, Owen, sadly, but we the last time we met was November 2019, and I set it out there in my speech to our party delegates, and I believe that we can we can have our referendum, win it, and win it well in the course of this decade, and it's my job as the leader of Sinn Féin with my colleagues and with wider society to navigate us to that certain and safe shore. Wow. United Ireland within a decade. That's, that's big. You hit it here, everyone. Well, hello. What an honour. Well, hello, Owen Jones. How are you? I haven't, oh. You and I have not spoken for a while. It's, I think we do an interview once a year, and each year things get progressively worse, if we're going to be honest. I'm not saying that's to do with our interviews, but... Yeah, well, I, th I think the quality of our interviews, in fairness, is probably getting better. As to the kind of political environment and the quality of the discourse, well, I think that's kind of a mixed bag, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think definitely more mixed here than over there, to be honest with you. Here it's it's mixed, but not in a good way in any sense. I'm sure we'll 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 come on to that. Let's start. Let's how should, 2020. Let's just how would you because 2020 has been a whirlwind for you, but it's also been the worst year uh, humanities as a whole face since World War Two. So how what's your general take on 2020 before we ask? I ask some questions. Well, you know what? I I think that there will be uh, very few tears shed for the passing of 2020. What a year! Who could have who could have forecast this time last year? what the world would go through, as you say, oh, in a, a global pandemic, um, all of the economic disruption that that has caused, the social displacement and disruption, and a huge amount of, of uh, suffering, human suffering. So it's been rough. It's been really rough for, for some families who have been bereaved in the most heartbreaking of circumstances, bereaved in circumstances where you couldn't even grieve your dead in the in the normal way. It's been a hard a hard year for people who have lost work, lost their jobs, lost income. Um, but I think maybe more most tragically this year has been really really hard for for people who may have lost heart. You know, people who feel now more isolated, maybe more disadvantaged. And more concerned that actually, you know, society and the world um, cannot change in a way that makes their lives better. So that's the kind of the, the negative side of the ledger. And God, it, it, the news, uh, however, belatedly in, in 2020, that there's some sign of vaccines and the distribution of vaccines at least offers some glimmer of hope at the, at the end of the of the tunnel but you know me i am always a glass half full kind of person i believe like for for activists for those of us who, who want to change things who want a better and a fairer society you, you have to reach for your your optimistic you know self no matter how deeply you have to go looking for that so but yeah it's been it's been a really really hard year for people in terms of the pandemic i mean the british response could barely have been worse. We've got the worst death toll in Europe. Uh, excess deaths now, we're looking at about 80,000 people, but official 60,000. If we, if I was doing a comparison, see, see, see what you think about this. Uh, in, if we're looking at deaths per million, Britain's actually about twice as bad as Ireland. So would it be fair to say, well, actually, despite the horror, obviously all deaths, absolutely horrific. You've had over 2,000 deaths in Ireland, obviously a smaller population, but nonetheless, is it is it the case that you would congratulate the Irish government, obviously all the main opposition party in Ireland, on their handling? Or is it a bit more complicated than that? Well, I mean, in as much as the Irish government and authorities had the good sense to listen to the advice of the experts at a European and a global level, particularly the World Health Organization, yes, of course, Congratulations is always due for those that follow a pathway of rationality, good sense and, and good advice. And I mean, the, the approach by the Tory government initially to hang their hat on herd immunity and a kind of a laissez-faire approach 
was really, really dangerous. Um, and of course, it had a direct implication for us on this island for two reasons. Because of our proximity, you are our next door neighbours, but also because in the north of Ireland, uh, in six of our counties, the British still have jurisdiction. And we were really, really concerned that our unionist colleagues were looking to London, looking to Boris, looking to this strategy that was just really dangerous when you're dealing with a novel virus that was, you know, a killer virus. So um, that was that was not a good start. I mean, certainly in the north of Ireland, things came around eventually. Uh, and although we don't have anything like the kind of synergy that we require across the island to really get ahead and stay ahead of, of this virus, um, at a minimum, we managed to blunt the worst excesses of, of that Tory approach. And then I think as the story unfolded, um, I think the government in London itself uh, reorientated its uh, approach. And to be honest with you, and you know, when when we look, you know, proportionally or in, in ratios or statistics around d death rates and so on, I mean, I, I'm reluctant to give anyone or any of us a clap on the back uh, in circumstances like that. I mean, on, on the one hand, for any government, any administration, when you're faced with a pandemic, something as unprecedented in our lifetimes as this, that's that's a big challenge. And secondly, you know, for people who have suffered, who have been bereaved, who've been sick, who've lost work, like it's no good to them or no use to them for us to kind of engage in any kind of finger pointing and say, we did it better than you. The truth is that... Uh, our government here in Dublin didn't get it 100% right either. Um, in Belfast, it was a mixed bag too. But but it would be, I suppose, fair to say that initially the kind of the Boris Johnson view of this virus and the approach was, you know, was was reckless. I mean, I, I thought it was crackers. But they, they refined that position and they... They, they move back from it. I hope the endeavours in the distribution of the vaccine are much more successful much earlier on. That'll be great news all around. The British government's just announced that there'll be no public inquiry as things stand into the murder of the Belfast solicitor, Pat Finnegan, of course, murdered back in 1989. Even the former leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party, David Cameron, spoke of shocking levels of collusion between the British state and loyalist paramilitaries. So firstly, what's your response to the government's refusal to have a public inquiry? And secondly, how great do you think the scale was between the British state and loyalist paramilitaries? And, and, and what, what does that say? What are the, what, how damning an indictment is that and the failure to come to terms with it? Well, look, I, I, I mean, the the story of collusion, the story of um, that relationship between uh, the British state and loyalist paramilitaries and, and um, combatants is probably the untold story of the conflict here in Ireland. And I can assure you that Pat Finucane was not the only victim of British state collusion, although he is arguably the most high profile victim. Um, Pat was a solicitor. He represented Republican clients, but, but loyalists as well. He was extremely effective, particularly in the system of Diplock courts, which is, as you know, are juryless courts. And um, he got, he got uh, mentioned by uh, Douglas Hogg in the House of Commons a matter of weeks uh, before he was assassinated in February 1989. And as you have recalled, Owen, he was assassinated in his family home in the presence of his wife and his three young children. And the reason why the British state has resisted again and again th the need for a public inquiry into Pat's killing is because it tells the story in, may in maybe the most dramatic way of the extent and the level of state collusion with loyalist paramilitaries. And there is a belief that the planning of uh, Pat's uh, killing was not just a matter of British intelligence or secret services, but that in fact, it went to the very, very top of British politics. So, I mean, back in uh, 2001 um, at Weston Park, 
uh, an agreement was struck between the Irish government and the British government around a number of contentious killings, one of which was Pat Finucan. And in 2001, it was agreed that a public inquiry would happen, but that, uh, you know, they, they appointed then Judge Corrie, if you recall, a very eminent um, justice from Canada. Judge Corrie went off, did his work, made his assessment and came back and said, yes, that Pat Finucan, there must be a public inquiry. There were to be public inquiries into other killings, by the way, as well, including the killings of two RUC, two police officers. Um, and the Dublin government uh, had to hold that inquiry, and they did, and that inquiry has reported. But on the question of Pat Finucan, the answer is consistently no from the British establishment. So what this tells you is that there is a very powerful set of people within the British establishment for whom the telling of the story of Pat Finucan is unconscionable. It also tells you that uh, the British state is very anxious that the story of their dirty war here on this island is not told. And they have held to that. And do you know what? He asked me for my reaction to last week to Brandon Lewis's decision and the British government decision. I mean, I like people, not just in Ireland, but internationally, were, were angry again. Um, were we shocked? Maybe not. Um, but angry none, nonetheless. But what really I found most incredibly, uh, he, he said to the Finucan family, look, we're not having a public inquiry. We're going to leave it to the police and the ombudsman in the north of Ireland to look at these matters. The, the police, by the way, came out shortly afterwards, the chief constable to say, well, sure, we have no new line of inquiry. Like there's nothing actively happening within the police or the, or the ombudsman. So that was an absolute red herring. But the extraordinary thing was that Brandon Lewis actually said to Geraldine Finucane and to Pat's widow, look, I'm not ruling out a public inquiry sometime in the future. Now, think about it. Pat was murdered more than 30 years ago. The, uh, the agreement to a public inquiry goes back almost 20 years. And you have Brandon Lewis saying to this family, no, well, hold on. We might do it, but just not now. I mean, it's it's disgraceful, really, on on every level. And and the real problem with it is ultimately, for for an island that needs to heal itself, and for people that need to be reconciled, part of that is dealing with the past. We can't undo the damage, the hurt, but we can certainly address the division that that has has fostered. And for that to happen. You have to have the truth, not just about Republican, you know, combatants, the IRA or the loyalists or although all of that is, of course, part of the story. But crucial and central to all of this is the role of the British state. And they can run, they can hide. Brandon Lewis can can frustrate things as his predecessors have. But the story of Pat Finucane has to be told and, and eventually will be told but it, it's just quite something that they have put the family through this. It's, it's in, in a line of dishonourable acts and decisions. This is right up there as the most dishonourable. And of course, uh, Pat Thunnigan's uh, son, John, is a Sinn Féin MP up in Belfast North and has written an article for The Guardian. Very, obviously, an extremely emotional thing for him to write about, but he, he wrote how... They were around the din dinner table in the kitchen of our home in Belfast. I was eight years old. I sat with my mother, my sister and brother and suddenly ended up squeezed into a corner as gunmen fired shot after shot into the prone figure of my father. He was 39 years old when he died. Just unimaginable uh, horror for him to, to have to witness at such a young age with his father. Um, so, And by the way, Owen, just on that subject and... John, if he was here, would, would make the same point. Just so as no one has the wrong end of the stick, this isn't about either special treatment for the Finucans or, you know, the Finucans, you know, as against any other victim or, or their family, not at all. But what makes the, the Finucan story so exceptional is that in perhaps the most dramatic way, it lays bare the fact of collusion by the British state with loyalist paramilitaries and murder gangs in the course of what was 
a very, very vicious war here in Ireland. So any pretense that the British state was kind of a, a, a bystander or, you know, was holding the ring between warring factions, you know, is just not true. The fact is that they were active participants in that war. Brexit. How could we avoid talking about Brexit? Mm. The only good thing about 2020 is it seemed like maybe we just wouldn't talk about Brexit anymore. But here we are. When Boris Johnson negotiated his deal with the EU, um, did part of you think, well, actually, this is going to bring a United Ireland closer? He threw the DUP into the Irish Sea, customs border between the two islands. Theresa May herself said no British government could ever agree to this. The Conservatives and Unionists are helping to deliver the United Ireland that your party exists to fight for? Well, look, I, I think Boris Johnson just had to bow to the logic of geography and, and politics in the decision that he made. It certainly was a, a far cry from what Theresa May had said in terms of a, a border in the Irish Sea. Um, but, but just remember that whatever way Brexit finally lands, it's not going to be good news for, for us in Ireland. And I respectfully suggest that it, it's not great news for people in in uh, in England, you know, uh, or across Britain, I would have thought, I mean, I, I wouldn't fancy the idea of a deregulated Tory-run uh, paradise where everything, all regulation and standards are up for grabs. And I say that, as you know, Owen, as somebody who would be very critical of the European project and in, 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 in the manner in which it has lost its way that is beyond question. But the answer to that was never a Tory Brexit and isn't a Tory Brexit so far as we're concerned. People in the north of Ireland voted to remain. Um, and the idea of the north being coerced out of the European Union against the expressed will of people is absolutely unacceptable. Um, but that's where it's at. And as you say, so long as our island is partitioned, and it has been now for almost 100 years, so long as the occupant of number 10 Downing Street in Westminster has a say in Irish uh, affairs and decisions that affect us here on this island, well, then we, we have a problem. Um, but I suppose the, the other reality is that Brexit has put Irish unity front and centre as a discussion. And the border on the island, you see, is now not just an Irish problem, it's now a European problem for all sorts of reasons. Um, and I think the prospect of Irish unity as a common sense approach, as the best plan for people who, who live on this island is now becoming clearer and clearer. So I, I, I think it would be an overstatement to say that Brexit will make Irish reunification happen but I think it would be a very fair and accurate analysis to say that certainly Brexit has pushed ahead that argument and the logic for self-government, the logic for um, decisions being made that affect the people of this island being taken here on this island and not in, in London. So there was the Irish election at the beginning of the year in that pre-pandemic world, which seems like another universe, let's be honest. Sinn Féin did very well. I'm sure you're very chuffed. But you didn't stand enough candidates. So actually, you would have done better. Are you like, oh, what are we like? <laughs> what are you, seriously, do you regret it? Do you look back and think? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Absolutely. And it, it, would, take, it, it would take you, Why Owen, happen? it would take you, Owen, to put the question so bluntly, like, don't spare my feelings, whatever <laughs> you do. Yeah, we, sh we should have run more candidates. Absolutely. And if I had, if I had been in possession of a crystal ball and if I could have, accurately predicted what we were going to meet out on the campaign trail and the fact that that momentum for change would just grow so strongly. Yes, of course, we would have run more candidates and we would have had more uh, more uh, parliamentarians, more chapter Dali uh, elected. But look, uh, we, we still came out with the highest popular vote. We now lead the, the opposition, first time for Sinn Féin to lead the opposition here in Dublin. First time, actually, for a woman to lead the opposition at all. So there you go. It only took, what, 100 years. That's the <laughs> make of that what you will. Um, and, and best of all, um, I, I can tell you that that appetite still for change, for political ch change beyond kind of Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, the same old same, 
is very much uh, alive and kicking. So we have a lot of work to do to prepare. We we are proving to be, I think, a very effective and powerful opposition here uh, in Dublin. But of course, we want to be in government. After the next election, I want Sinn Féin not alone to be in government. I want us to lead the next government. So we have a lot of work to do. And not least, I have to be absolutely sure that we run the right number of candidates next time. So what's really striking is young it's younger people who are disproportionately flocking to Sinn Féin. You've got a very considerable lead amongst younger voters. And that's kind of replicated a lot in terms of what's going on around the Western world. Progressive parties doing better amongst younger people, which isn't actually historically what has tended to happen. We haven't had these big generational divides, uh, contrary to popular belief. Uh, but, you know, it's the same with Labour here. It's been the same with parties like Podemos in Spain. It's been the same with the Bernie Sanders phenomenon in the United States. So why do you think you're attracting younger people? But also, why aren't you winning over older people in the amounts you need if you want to get more support and, and what are you can do about it? I, I just think that, um, you know, every ideas have their moment and their time. And I think to, to speak for a specific Irish context, we have come to a point now where the kind the, the traditional model of politics, North and South, is now under scrutiny and it's under pressure, but a positive pressure. And there is an appetite for change, which is undoubtedly generational. I mean, there is absolutely no doubt, not just in elections, but in key societal changes, like, for example, marriage equality or the Eighth Amendment and um, abortion rights, that the young, younger people have absolutely been the energy, the core energy that has driven that politics. But the interesting thing with generational change is it's not just the young generation who drive that change, who are part of it, that changes everybody and changes everything in a very essential way. So although Sinn Féin, you're right, attracts huge levels of support for younger people, um, and I'm very proud of that. I mean, that, that energy is essential to delivering our political project. We are, we are actually also increasingly... Uh, growing our support base in, in the other demographics amongst older uh, voters as well, because we live in a small community. I mean, we're an island people. We, we don't have a huge population base. You know, we're quite tight knit. So when young people change things and bring that to the table, they change everybody in the process of doing it, if you, if you understand uh, what I mean. I think it's really interesting when I, I look as again, we're island people, so we look outwardly. I think it's really interesting to see what you've described there across the continent and across the globe. And you can discern really defined, deep, um, you know, veins of, of, of the change that people that, that this generation want and what's, what that's going to look like and everything from obviously the climate justice agenda, um, the equality and human rights agenda in terms of colour, in terms of um, all forms of, of identity, including class. Um, and you can see a demand for an economy that serves society and not vice versa. So I actually think the whole global system, not to sound too grandiose about it, but I think there is there is a generational challenge, a really positive generational challenge that that's coming at the political establishment right across the world. And I think it's it, it's it's of its time H how that will play out on this island, I believe, will be a, an absolute increased press for social justice, for the politics of equality, but also for the politics of reunification and democracy. These things are are knitted together in the politics of Ireland. But but it's a great thing. Very often, by the way, our critics um, and our opponents have taken to saying, well, Sinn Féin have only done well because young people don't know what they're doing or don't know their history or don't really know what they want. You know, incredibly condescending kind of view. But as we have grown as a political party, the political establishment that used to describe us just as a party of protest, like that's the box they put us in. Now, no, 
that that's patently untrue and that we are a party that is very much about taking decisions and driving change so we can no longer be boxed as a party of protest so instead they they look at young people and say well that's all right but they're they don't know what they're doing can i tell you irish young people know exactly what they're doing and they they have a, a political roadmap a shared roadmap amongst themselves and um, that they are now very actively pushing and i think that's hugely exciting i mean i, I really think it's brought a, a real bounce and currency to irish political life because people who arguably have the most to gain and potentially the most to lose younger people are now active and at it and are talking politics in a way that's refreshing and challenging and brilliant quite frankly um after the last crash or after the last big economic crisis there was a lot of austerity came cuts not least in ireland and it had a terrible impact on people's living standards do you think that's going to happen in all over again and what's Sinn Féin going to argue what's the alternative Sinn Féin's going to argue when people start saying we had to pay the a huge cost look at the deficit you know you know and they'll start making economically illiterate comparisons with household budgets what are you going to what are you going to argue for instead well we're going to argue common sense we're going to say you know uh, the reality is that as with the last crisis uh, and now this crisis, which bear in mind, is a public health crisis, the COVID disaster that has, has come into play. Um, you, you're not cutting your way uh, out of that. In fact, austerity does more damage than good, you know. So the the approach that has to be taken is an approach of investment and growth and renewal. That's what needs to happen. That's what it should have happened last time around, but it didn't. A disastrous, destructive, socially and economically destructive approach of austerity was adopted. And um, I, I think, you know, when you, when you reflect on it, people were only coming to terms with or, or get, getting their balance again with, with the, the, the real damage that that had inflicted and getting back on their feet and then bang, COVID happened. So I think this time around though, Oh, and if you listen to the rhetoric internationally, or if you look, say, at the behaviour of the European institutions, they're actively encouraging governments to borrow, 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 and invest, invest, invest. Because I think this time round, there is an acceptance so far, and let me emphasise so far, that cuts and austerity could, could do nothing other than really drive um, what is uh, a crisis phase into a much more permanent uh, crisis. So that has been resisted so far. But but I, I have no doubt that um, the usual suspects at some point in time will come and make the kind of argument that you've articulated there around comparing the running of a society to you know the running of a household and the running of, a con of an economy to make a parallel to a household budget when all of us know that those are inaccurate comparisons and that... Um, you know, economies borrow and borrow for good uh, reason. The, the reality is it's, it's the quality of decision making and the decisions around how you invest and where you invest and at what level you invest that actually makes the distinction between economies and societies that are prosperous and equal and fair and economies that um, yo-yo up and down between boom and bust and have sets of, of citizens that are protected and provided for, and then vast numbers of citizens who are left out in the cold. And we will uh, argue all day, every day, for investment in society and in our economy to drive up productivity, to drive up prosperity, to ensure that you have you know, appropriate and necessary uh, distributive policies so that you have an equal society because equal societies are more prosperous societies. They're yeah. safer societies. And it, it was interesting, actually, when, when COVID hit, it, it really laid bare some of the deep, deep um, scars in our society. So, for example, we have a housing issue here, as you know, Owen, on this island, particularly in Dublin, although not only in Dublin, and, and safe uh accommodation, decent accommodation has been a huge challenge uh, here and remains so. And then along comes COVID and to all the naysayers who 
who, you know, disregarded the argument around a, a person's right to shelter and accommodation. Along comes COVID and drives the point home because COVID demonstrated without a fear of contradiction the need for a, a, a place to to isolate, to self-isolate, to keep yourself out of harm's way, and so on and so forth. So for anybody who, who argued the toss with the left and said that we were just being nanny staters in arguing for public housing and safe accommodation and a proper set of, of rent controls and all of that, we have been proven right. COVID has demonstrated that what we said around the necessity for safe and appropriate accommodation was bang on, not just as, as a matter of a, a, a civic and, and a human right, but also in terms of the protection of public health now. Just a couple of final questions. Um, and I should say these come from the north of Ireland because these are the sort of questions as a Brit, I just feel a bit uncomfortable putting to you. But this, this is what we have putting in. So one, what would you say to people in the north? Oh, in terms of reassuring unionists in United Ireland. So obviously there's a unionist community up in the north. They obviously are unionists. They, wanna, they don't want a United Ireland. So how would you reassure them in a United Ireland? Well, just to say, not not alone do we have unionist uh, citizens, we have citizens that are British. Do you know what I mean? And they're British today. They'll be British over Christmas and into the new year. They're British in a partitioned Ireland and they will be British in a united Ireland. Um, and I, I think it's important to stress that we're not, although we have a huge amount of pre preparatory work to do for an orderly co constitutional transition, of that there is no doubt, we're not starting totally from ground zero and particularly as regards issues of identity and citizenship. So the Good Friday Agreement recognises people's right to be Irish or British or both. Um, that that will prevail into a reunified um, Ireland, a, a citizen's right to carry British papers, Irish papers and by extension European papers and passports or both. That will prevail. And I'm offering that up, I suppose, as an example to, to say to people not to equate the reunification project with threat or loss. The reunification program, program has to be about gain and additionality. And I would say to our unionist friends, be part of this conversation. I, I absolutely respect the fact that unionists themselves can articulate best their needs, their ideas, and their concerns around a, reunif a reunified Ireland, much better than I can as an Irish Republican woman. So I think we need to make space for that conversation. I think we need to uh, acknowledge e each other. I, I think ideally we need to appreciate each other. And, and just maybe to say this, and maybe this is the most reassuring thing that I can say as the leader of Sinn Féin, Irish reunification isn't just a Sinn Féin thing, although we will campaign for it and work for it and, and all the rest. This is a national project and it belongs to everybody, everybody's view, mm -hmm. everybody's perception, everybody's idea, everybody's vision has to go into that great melting pot. And um, I, I, unlike the, the Taoiseach, the serving Taoiseach and the previous one here in Dublin who would say, now is not the time. Don't be talking about reunification. Don't talk about the referendum on unity. Don't talk about preparing. I think that's wrongheaded. I don't think that gives any comfort to anybody, including our unionist brothers and sisters, because it is self-evident that the winds of change are blowing. That's evident that there's no sense in sticking your head in the sand. So the reassuring thing the steadying thing, the inclusive thing to do is to plan and to have a citizens assembly or a forum that is open to one and all uh, to, to have those conversations. It's interesting, actually, on recently, the former leader of the DUP, Peter Robinson, has come out very clearly and has, has challenged what he called um, referendum or border poll deniers. Uh, that's how he's characterizing, you know, the, the, the bury your head in the sand brigade, that there's no comfort or reassurance for anyone in that. So I would say it's, you know, it's game on now. So let's talk, let's plan, let's listen to each other. 
let's find perspectives. And even for those who don't want Irish reunification, for whom that's not plan A, for, who will go out in a referendum campaign and argue for the union, which they're more than entitled to do, that that's that's as it is. But but for all of us, including them, you have to have plans A and B and C, because ultimately it, the, the vote of the referendum, 50% plus one is the democratic threshold. And once that's achieved, constitutional change will happen. So let's fashion that together. It's going to be fun having the Democratic Unionist Party sitting in the Irish Parliament, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, look... Why not? I mean, straight. Listen, I mean, there was a time where if uh, you had said that the late Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley would be in government together, I mean, people would have said that is out there. That's mm. crazy. It's not going to happen. But it happened. And not alone did it happen. And um, it was, you know, politically, a, 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 OK, a bumpy ride, but ultimately fairly successful. And those two men actually became friends. They They didn't just end up in government together they actually they forged a friendship so we should never we shouldn't overstate we you have to understand difference and you have to not be foolish or try and play it down or run away from it but we should never ever underestimate our capacity to adapt and our capacity to accommodate each other and when the context changes as is happening in Ireland now, well, then people's political perspectives and their ideas and so on change uh, as well. Just the fi fi final little, uh, question, which also keeps coming up. Um, okay. The National Health Service is something which people are very proud of. And Ireland's a bit of an outlier. It doesn't have... It is an outlier in the Western world. As a country without a universal, free at the point of use health system for all. So what would you say to citizens in the north of Ireland who are like quite tempted by the United Ireland thing, but I don't want to lose the NHS? I'd say no. I'd say to them, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and I would say to them that the, the challenge for us is to build an Irish National Health Service. I mean, what we have currently in the south is, as you have described, we have a confused two-tier and very expensive by the way health service we have the highest levels of private health insurance here in this state uh, anywhere in the world bar the united states of america we spend a huge amount of money on health by the way our our workers in the public health service and the private service are outstanding um but the model of delivery is is just it, it's built up in a piecemeal inefficient and completely um, unequal way. And we need to change that in the North. There is the National Health Service, which is, is good, but it's a health service that has been absolutely ravaged by Tory austerity. So that's what we have now. What we need to get to is a an Irish National Health Service um, free uh, at the point of delivery, universal provision. That's, that's what we need. To get there, we actually have two reform processes agreed north and south here in the south it's called sloinsha care which is sloinsha means health health care so it's a reform program you know it's it's quite good it's um it's cross-party endorsed it, it's not quite as far as Sinn Féin would have gone but we recognize many of the building blocks that are necessary and then in the north we have a process called the Bengoa uh, uh, approach which actually was um which was delivered by my uh, colleague, Michelle O'Neill, when she was the Minister for Health. And again, that's a platform for reform and change. And what we need to do is marry all of that up and assess how you deliver our National Health Service, how you fund it, structurally what it looks like. And it's not all negative. We have, we have many positive elements within the system, so it's not all gloom and doom. But we need radical change there. Of that, there's right. no doubt. I'm not asking anybody <laughs> to be part of a reunified Ireland that still has uh, an inefficient, expensive uh, health system where you have to pay 60 euro or more to see your GP, where you're left endlessly on waiting lists. I don't want that. That's not acceptable to me or my family. And I don't want it for anyone else. So, and I absolutely, by the way, understand, Owen, that when people are talking about Irish reunification, 
that you know it's not it's not necessarily the issues of identity or flags or anthems although those are important and sensitive it it is actually the issue of healthcare that most immediately grabs people so we need to plan for that and i don't want the healthcare system that we currently have here so i would say to them i'm with you and um i will i'll fight for that national health service for you and your family and and for me and for mine so very finally, very final question, little pity response. How far away is the United Ireland? We'll do it in the next decade. We'll do it in this decade, actually. This is the decade of opportunity. I was saying that we, we've no Ordesh, we've no party conference this year, um, Owen, sadly. But we the last time we met was November 2019. And I set it out there in my speech to our party delegates and I believe that we can we can have our referendum win it and win it well in the course of this decade. And it's my job as the leader of Sinn Féin with my colleagues and with wider society to navigate us to that certain and safe shore. Wow. United Ireland within a decade. That's that's big. You hit it here, everyone. He- heard it here first. As ever, Owen Jones with the breaking news. Exclusive. Thank you so much, Mary Lou McDonald. That was absolutely fantastic, and it was a pleasure to have you on as ever. We'll do this as a, a annual, a annual. Is it coming event? Good, it? Yeah, and do you know the amazing thing is, I, I, I year and year I can see myself aging, but you're like Dory in grey. You know, you obviously, I don't know what you're doing, but it's working. It's socialism <laughs> is a great skincare routine. I stand by that. Um, <laughs> but also, there is someone in the attic. Um, but uh, it's a it's a huge pleasure, and I I will speak to you soon. But thank you for thank you for the interview. Thank you so much.